next on Viewpoint. 40 to 45 million Christians will not vote. So it's that's a powerful number. Do churches need to get more involved in politics? And what are the rules for dating after a divorce? And later, does the church need to change its methods on reaching the lost? We're failing, including me. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. The separation of church and state is often a quoted policy, despite the fact it really isn't in our Constitution. The courts and public policy have pulled a lot of church out of our government. But should the church stop talking about the government and politics? Walt Shepard's a pastor and he believes the church and politics should go together. We should be involved in the political situations in our, in our country. Yes, and I believe that um, uh, the churches have become quite quiet. They've been silent uh, in this Neutered process. Almost, yes. Yeah, and yet you still have a Matthew chapter 5 and uh, where it says that we're to be the salt and light of this world. Mm -hmm. And so how does uh, someone as a Christian, a Bible believer, become salt or light when they don't do anything with the policies that are directing the culture and the decisions that are being made to legislate really what laws would be around us? And so uh, I, I say Jude 3 says also said we're, we're to earnestly contend for the faith. And so a lot of, a lot of Christians that are sitting in churches uh, are behind four mm -hmm. walls and the liberal media and the liberal left is okay if you could just stay behind your four walls, there. believe what you want, but just don't, don't bring it into, here's another key word here, a couple words, is don't bring it into public arena. Yep. Just keep what you believe to yourself, but don't tell anybody else about it. Or they, uh, you can come out as an individual, and, and they, they don't care. They'll, they'll shoot you down as an individual if you come out in the public arena, but they don't want the church. They know there's a power in the church. They don't want the oh. church yes. teaching or encouraging people to become involved in that because there, there's statistics you had one of, about the people that are involved in, in uh, 80 million. the election process. Yes. There's 80 million, and this is polls, 80 million Christians voting age that are in churches and it's, it's across the board, any uh, Christian churches mm -hmm. across the America. And they say any given election cycle between 30 and 35 million of those 80 million Christians vote. Less so than that's, half. Less than half, 40 to 45 million Christians will not vote. So it, it's, that's a powerful number. As you look at your, con your own congregation, wh why would you say people are going to sit in the pews and not go to the voting booth? I think there's several reasons. I think, one, they're not being informed by the pulpits. I think there's a fear factor in that they're, uh, they're afraid perhaps to say anything because of the loud voice that the small minority of our country has. But I'll say the left is quite concerned about the direction of our country going back right again. Uh, you think about all the issues that, were, that are on our day. Transgender education in, mm -hmm. in, in five-year-old classes over in California. That's legislation that's being trying to be put through. Mm -hmm. uh, LBGTQ uh, uh, movement, the same-sex marriage, abortion. Uh, you go through any issue of the day that we're dealing with, and it's exploding every day. Way before they became political issues, they were biblical issues. Mm -hmm. And so as Bi if I'm a Bible believer, and if your listeners are Bible believers, then we have a responsibility to take those Bible principles and share them in the public mm -hmm. arena and let people know what the Bible says and being salt or light in this world. Well, what's happened is they, they use this statement, separation of church and state, and they also use the fear factor of you start preaching that from the pulpit, and you're going to lose your, your, your exempt tax status. Yes. You're going to lose your 501c3. You're, not going to, you're no longer going to be tax exempt. And so they use that fear and they, they kind of whip that over the churches to keep them out of that arena. Our How, issue, is, is, that, is, that, is that legitimate? Yeah, well, no. Uh, it, yeah, we do, have, uh, we do have the fear that that uh, statement, uh, separation of church and state, and that's being floated around. But of course, we understand it's not a constitutional statement. Je Jefferson, 19, in 1881, yeah. put that in, uh, in the Dan Baptist Danbury Association. Uh, it was not even part of the Constitution. Wall. Yeah, yeah. He, he, what he was saying, and the spirit of what he was saying, is what, that he did not want the uh, state to be in the church, but he wanted the church to influence the state. Yeah. He didn't want a state church, so he didn't want a Church of England like we they we just came away from came that. away from that. Yes. Uh, he wanted to have a influence from the church to the state. If we have a legitimate right to be involved in the political arena, we have a, a responsibility and mandate from the word. Has the church stepped out, or have we been kicked out? I think the church has stepped out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're, they're, the, the fear that uh, we've been kicked out is based on a Johnson Amendment. Uh, and, and I hear sometimes, you know, when I'm preaching on, on issues that are moral issues or political issues of our day, 
And, uh, and I'll occasionally get someone say, Pastor, you're going to endanger our church tax exempt status if you keep it up. And, uh, and of course, the Johnson Amendment is getting people so scared to say mm -hmm. anything. And this is, again, a good way to keep us quiet. For those who don't know, tell us about the Johnson Amendment. Johnson Amendment was, uh, was put forth to be able to basically control the pulpits from endorsing candidates and having candidates be able mm -hmm. to come in and use a platform yeah. as a as a, a platform to right. uh, uh, to the run an office, church, right? right. Uh, but but boy, we've go, we've gone so far the other way where we don't even speak about issues mm -hmm. and uh, and being able to take these issues. Another is interesting uh, thought is that when God destroyed, and I believe this, I believe our country, the Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any mm -hmm. people, and uh, we have in, we have uh, exalted sin in our nation. Uh, we have, I read the statistic this morning, 7.6 million babies that have been murdered, yeah. uh, taken from the womb, innocently, innocent blood, and some just thrown in a trash can. Uh, that's an indictment against our nation. And in 1973, when they put, the uh, Supreme Court agreed mm -hmm. that lawfully they can do that, uh, I believe that set us on a horrible course uh, for the judgment of God. And I do believe that. We are under the impending judgment of God. However, uh, I know that that's coming, but when God judges, he usually takes his people out before he judges. Mm -hmm. Case in point, when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, he was bringing Lot right. and his family yeah. out. Now, last time I checked, there are some very good God-fearing men and women that are in political uh, offices that are in Washington, D.C., and they plead with me. I go there every year, and they plead with us, and they say, please, get your people involved. This is a yeah. cesspool, and we need to hear from you. One of them said to me that every phone call that anyone makes from their district represents 1,000 people. It's so it's powerful. And you, it's you, powerful. you look at that one phone call, 1,000 people, you look at 80, 000, 80 million people sitting in churches, half of which, more than half of which are not voting, and you look at the power that's there to do what God's called us to do, and we're still not doing it. What can we do as a church? I mean, if you, your, your church is apparently doing some of this. What, what can churches do to, to not risk their 501c3, not risk their tax-exempt status, but at the same time to be politically active in, in, uh, in a biblical way. Well, there's, uh, again, there's, there's, uh, there's do's and don'ts that mm -hmm. you can do. You can get those off a, a lot of different good websites. But the, the Christian voice, the voice needs to be made. And it needs to be heard. Uh, uh, the pastors, if they could take, we're so busy. Pastors are very busy yep. doing this. In a you lot only of work things. on Sunday. Yeah, that's it. We don't <laughs> we don't work hardly at all. But uh, but if you can get a key person out of the church, if they can uh, have someone that's, that's inclined to uh, politics, understands policies, mm -hmm. and bring them up and have them do the research on these issues, and then once a week or once every two weeks or every once a month. Just kind of say, listen, th this, this particular issue is coming up for vote. Please call your representative. Here's a number to call. Make it easy for the church. So that's number one. Number two, mm -hmm. you can conduct voter registration. Uh, we, we could uh, we'll be surprised how Churches many... Churches down south did that for years. Absolutely. Yeah. Get, get people in the church that are not registered to vote, uh, to vote. Just get out there and get registered. So conduct that. It wouldn't take hard, uh, much do, to do. Do some pastors think, well, that, that's, that's a worthless operation. Not everybody here votes. But n with that statistic, they, I know pastors, they've, got, they've, they've got a lot of people that could uh, register. Right. I know pastors, good people, good men that preach this book. And uh, when they start getting informed about the representative mm -hmm. government that they're in right now, which is a gift of God, when they start finding that out, they said, uh, some of them admitted, said, I have not voted for 20 years of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm wow. back in. So that's, uh, that's a huge shift. I think that's a blessing, actually. Every major, if you look at every major leader in the Bible, uh, you have Elijah. Uh, he had some connection to the political leader, Ahab. Mm -hmm. Joseph had a political leader to Pharaoh. Moses had a uh, connection to Pharaoh. Paul, Agrippa, Jonah, the king of Nineveh, on and mm -hmm. on. Uh, you'll be hard pressed to find a, a spiritual leader in the Bible that did not connect to the known government of his or her day. And you'll find that. And so I would say this, in our culture, we have for the last 40 years, we have stepped away from that arena and that arena is affecting us, whether we like it or not, is affecting us. 7.6 million down. babies yeah. have been affected from a decision right. that the church uh, in 1973 handed this gen my generation and said, here you go. Well, I would like to take to the next generation, hand them a generation that says, you know what? We overthrew Roe v. Wade. 
And we can Wouldn't do that. that. Be, we uh, can do that. We can do that. I, I believe this uh, present administration, if we can get the right justices in there, we can overturn Roe v. Wade. That would be a blessing. We're talking about uh, making your voice heard, get a church liaison that keeps, keeps up to date on the issues conduct voter registration, and get, and get connected to political leaders. Even leaders. locally, I think they can pl get political leaders, get people in the, your local area, get connected, mm -hmm. get to know them. Uh, okay, politicians are scared of pastors, and pastors are scared of politicians. Well, in, in, in some cultures, the pastors become the politicians. That's true, that's true. We, we've, we've seen that in a lot of social justice churches, where that's the pastor true. Is, is, is passionate about what he's, right. what he's living, right. and he becomes a political uh, leader. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but if you, can, if you can get good godly men and good godly women in, in government and put them together and say, listen, this is what we believe. This is what the Bible mm -hmm. says. This, as you represent me, this is what I would want you to represent my, my values. And uh, it puts, it, it, I, again, I appreciate the wisdom that God gave our founding fathers in forming one of the most historical uh, experiments in the history of humankind, mm -hmm. the Constitution of the United States of America. Let's use it. Let's vote. Let's get out and do what we should civilly be part of, getting the Christian vote, being salt and light in this dark world. After the break. Really, I look for footnotes. I look for loopholes. I look for all kinds of things. So if you're single, you're not to be sexually active. What does the Bible say about dating after a divorce? That and more when Viewpoint returns. With so many single, divorced, and widowed, both in the church and in the dating world, we often know the expectations of a teenager dating, but do adults know what the Bible's expectations are? Mark Yonkin is professor at Valor Christian College and wrote the book, Make Like Lazarus, a perspective of divorce and remarriage. And Mark, you not only wrote the book, but you lived the life. I mean, you've, you've been divorced, you are remarried, you're in ministry now. Uh, what was that like when you're making that turn? Did you feel like you were making a turn in your life from I'm divorced, I may never marry again, and now I'm turning around to where I'm back, in, I, I'm back out there again. Uh, the advice I got was really good. It was make sure that you're whole, make sure that you're healed before you impose mm -hmm. that on somebody else's life. You need a small group of people that are to you as Barnabas was to mm -hmm. Paul. There's some accountability. Absolutely, right. so you need that accountability. So I had those, those relationships, and I did you know, broach the subject of that and it all comes down to the fact that you need to be assured of who you are and and you need to be whole because you don't want to you don't the next person that you date is not the garbage man right. mm -hmm. they don't deserve your garbage there, there's a there's a uh, chapter in your book uh, the dating game re-entering the war of the sexes without getting caught in the crossfire what's what's the, the biggest mistake singles make when they get back into that dating game I think that one of the big mistakes that you can make is getting into it too soon. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got baggage in your life, uh, a new person that may or may not become part of your part of your future doesn't necessarily deserve any of that. So you need to be you need to be square with all that um, to understand that. Uh, Every individual is, is unique, and because you see a behavior that a former spouse typified, mm -hmm. you know, the, in, in our flesh, we might want to say, oh, no, here we go again. I can't deal with this. I don't want that. You know, I, I, this is what I ran away from. You need to know who you are, mm -hmm. and you need to get to know the person that you're, uh, you know, potentially going to form a relationship with. Uh, I do a lot of uh, study and teaching on personality types. And it turns out that in a first marriage, opposites really do attract. Um, and it can be a natural thing to want to find someone of a totally different personality yeah. type. But the the more you get to know people, the, it, it's the best chances for success I've found are when you've got some similar characteristics. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be carbon copies of each other, but you have to have some of the same some of the same personality mm -hmm. characteristics, and of course, a love for a love for God and a love for His Son, 
Jesus Christ. I don't want to generalize, but teenagers dating are looking for romance. They're looking for more intimacy. They're looking for maybe even experimenting in, in sexual relationships, things like that. And you've, you're, you're, uh, both pre you're both married previously, and you're coming into this relationship, well, we've already been sexually active. It doesn't make a big difference. It's not a big deal. Uh, what about that intimacy? Do you talk about that? I, I talk, we talk about that in the book. There's a chapter, nine, things, nine decisions we're glad we made. Mm -hmm. And one of those decisions was to refrain from sexual activity until we were married. Um, it's real easy to try to bargain with God. You know, you know mm -hmm. Lord, I've been through <laughs> this terrible relationship, and now I've got this great woman in my life, and I really, really, really like her now, mm -hmm. so can't I just this once? Well, God's word's pretty clear. Se sexual activity is reserved for a marriage mm -hmm. between man and a woman. And there's no, I look for asterisks. I really, I look for footnotes. I look for loopholes. I look for all kinds of things. And they just aren't there. Mm -hmm. So if you're single, you're not to be sexually active. Mm -hmm. And with God's help, I, we committed to that. So and it was a discussion that you had and that you, and there was a, a firm commitment. It was absolutely yeah. a firm commitment. And, uh, Nancy's told me many times since then that she was she was glad that I was was firm on that, um, and she was worth it. Yeah. Is there any way? To, I mean, how do you guard against that when you're when you're spending time alone? I mean, if you both cave in at the same time, how do you guard against th those kind of well, things? Well, you can guard against that in a lot of ways. You can guard against that by the situations that you put yourself in. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't hang out at each other's apartments where there's a bedroom just down the hall. Mm -hmm. uh, when Nancy and I were first, first dating, there's a, there's a park in the northern part of Columbus called the Park of Roses. No, it won't. And there's a, there's a walking trail back and about halfway back there's a gazebo. And we took walks through that park and we sat at the gazebo. And we would talk until it got dark. Mm -hmm. And when the conversation slowed down, it turns out that she had found a relationship book and in the back there were 100 questions you need to ask uh, a potential mate before, before you're married. And she'd copied those questions out of the book and cut them up into little strips <laughs> and put them in an envelope. And when the conversation died down, she reached into the envelope and pulled a question <laughs> out or if it was my turn, I'd pull a question out. And we would talk Disgusting. through some, we would, we would sure. talk through some things. So, that's good to get to know each other, but at the same time, we're not putting ourselves in a situation where even if we wanted to uh, commit fornication mm -hmm. before we were married, you know, you're not going to do that in, the, you're not gonna do that in a public park. park. The book, again, is Make Like Lazarus, A Biblical Perspective of Divorce and Remarriage. Where do we pick this up at? The book's on Amazon.com and on BarnesandNoble.com. And the ebook is on those sites as well for the Kindle and the Nook, respectively. And just about any place else that you can find an ebook, Apple iBooks, things like that, then you can find the uh, ebook for that. You need to pick it up, especially if you're trying to recover from a divorce. Mark, thank you for being here. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. After the break, has the church forgotten its mission? I'm not going to be satisfied with looking at my year end report and we had two people saved or no people saved and nobody baptized. That and more when Viewpoint returns. A recent Barna survey revealed in the past 15 years the percentage of born-again Christians has fallen almost 10%. My next guest is a pastor who, for a time, worked at an auto dealership. His experiences makes him believe that both he and his church need to change their culture on winning the lost for Christ. Yeah, we're failing, including me. How do you, how do you set that scale? How do you set that benchmark? Where does that come from? <laughs> you, ask, number, you take a percentage of the number of people in the pews and say, okay, we should do 10%? No, <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, our, our elders, and I, I love them, mm -hmm. there's the spiritual leaders of the church, the deacons are spiritual godly men as well, and we faced this head on, Bob, and we simply acknowledged that where we are and where we've been for a while, mm -hmm. under my leadership, we have not succeeded in ways that are pleasing to God. Wow. And we said, what are we going to do? 
uh, because we have nice buildings. Uh, I preach pretty good. The people love me. I love them. Money. We have enough money. We've got the nice equipment. And so I got up one Sunday and said something like this. When I worked in the dealership, we had wonderful buildings. We had all the equipment we needed and cars galore. And so at the end of the year, somebody say, how many cars did you sell? Yeah. Well, we didn't sell any cars, but our buildings are really nice, <laughs> and lot. the equipment is good, yeah. and we love each other. And I said, that's kind of oh, where we are. And so what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Honesty is hard. It is very hard. It's very hard because the church family, though their intents are good, they allow it to go on mm -hmm. because, number one, it's, it's difficult to have a transformation in their own life. Right. And number two, to lead people to a place different than where they are is very threatening. And so our elders, in their discernment and wisdom, said, let's start in the simplest place possible. Let's begin to pray. I wish I could sit here, Bob, and tell you and our listening audience and those who are watching, uh, I, I am the poster boy for how this is done. <laughs> yeah. And the truth is, I failed miserably, but I'm no longer willing to continue to, to, to fail. That. I it's won't accept that. That's got to be a starting point. It is. Is, is, there, is there practical application for, this, for, the, for the, uh, the people in the pews? Yes. To, to teach him how to evangelize? I mean, yes. just take John 3.16 and hit somebody in the head with it? Or, nope. I mean, nope. has there been practical application that this is a good way to do this, to right. approach your neighbors or to, to, right. to become a friend? How do, you, how do you teach that? Um, a good answer to that, Bob, is I have a wonderful prayer partner. And for Christmas two years ago, he gave me this book, Once I Was Lost. And it is, it is a short book, an easy read, but this is written uh, by two men who personally interviewed over 2,000 people who came to Christ. Wow. And they asked them all the same question. What were the steps you went through in order to go from being lost and in darkness to being saved and in the light? And almost universally, they gave them five thresholds. Really? One, one threshold. How many people? Over 2,000. 2, and this book wow. is their stories and the thresholds. But, but tell me some of those steps. How, how, what, well, did, what did they say? What are these, these people yep. who, they're, they're the recipients. They call them thresholds. They know what they're talking and about. And there's five thresholds. The first is that when a person comes to Christ, and again, this is not every single person mm -hmm. in every circumstance, but this was their discovery right. and mine, largely, that a person coming into faith has to have a, a Christian friend that they trust. Not just a Christian friend, mm -hmm. but they trust. If they find a Christian friend who will walk life with them, then the second threshold it's is trustworthy. that they become curious. They say, why, why do you live your life that way? Why don't you get angry and swear? Why, why don't you talk about your wife the way Bob talks about mm -hmm. his wife at work? The, th the third is, that then after they've found someone to trust, they become curious, sometimes about that person's mm -hmm. life, but other times about why they're living their life the way they do. The third is that they begin to open up uh, to change, which That's is a new thought, yeah. which is a new thought for them. And then the fourth is they begin to seek after God in their own way with a little direction from their mm -hmm. friends. And then the fifth threshold is that they actually enter the kingdom by surrendering to the authority of Christ and becoming a Christ follower. So it's not necessarily the formula we, we, we've had in the Romans Road. Or the, it's, four spiritual it, laws. Yeah, four spiritual laws. It's, it's right. they, they've got to, first of all, they've got to find a Christian that they, they, do. Can, that they can trust. Yep. There's people out there that need to take that first step right now and become a friend to somebody and be trustworthy. One reason I believe, when I say this is the new thing, mm -hmm. it's not new at all. Yep. That's what Jesus did. That's what his disciples did. That's what the early church did. But I can remember a day in pastoring when you would talk to an unbeliever about the gospel. There was something down inside of them. They went to church, their parents or grandmother went to church, and they would say, I know that's mm -hmm. absolute truth. I'm just not obeying it. But today, that is not the case. People, they not only believe everything, they believe anything. Mm -hmm. Which we know. Well accepted. Yeah. And so for us yeah, as Christians, okay. our job is to to love them enough to give them mm -hmm. the most important thing we have, which is our heartbeats mm -hmm. and our life. And so the day of the four spiritual laws, I was part of Revival Ohio here in mm -hmm. Lima. I have nothing negative to say about any of that, but well, I'm there, convinced there fruit. Without, without this principle mm -hmm. of our people, Union Chapel, any person, any pastor saying, I'm not gonna be satisfied with looking at my year-end 
report and we had two people saved or no people saved and nobody baptized, mm -hmm. we are no longer going to let that be the norm. We are, we are partners as the body of Christ. We are the evidence of this invisible God in the world. Today you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page. Here's what's on the next Viewpoint. With more states making it legal, we'll hear from a pastor and his viewpoint on the recreational use of marijuana. So now that it's legalized, there's a lot of questions from people who've been walking with Jesus, so how, how are we supposed to navigate that? Next on Viewpoint.